welcome to this talk on the treatment of histoplasmosis. Uh, my name is Professor David Denning and I work at the University of Manchester. Um, what I'm going to do today is overview um, the treatment goals for histoplasmosis because some patients certainly need treatment and others do not and it's important to distinguish those situations and for those who do need treatment to be aware of the treatment outcomes for this disease. So antifungal therapy is always advised in immunocompromised patient, patients with histoplasmosis, AIDS patients or other transplant patients in particular. Acute pulmonary histoplasmosis often resolves without treatment and in fact often the diagnosis isn't made at all and so these patients don't need treatment but, but if they have had a very high inoculum and are very ill uh, then treatment is advised. The early initiation of ther therapy is associated with a much better outcome overall and saves lives in very ill patients. So it's important to consider the diagnosis early and treat as early as possible. The manifestations that are usually or always treated include uh, the severely ill patient with acute pulmonary histoplasmosis, chronic pulmonary hist uh, histoplasmosis, progressive or acute disseminated histoplasmosis, and the more chronic forms of disseminated disease, including adrenal gland involvement, colon or oropharyngeal disease. The manifestations that are not usually treated include the mild forms of acute pulmonary histoplasmosis, pulmonary nodules due to histo, mediastinal uh, histoplasmosis, including lymphadenopathy, adenitis, or fibrosis, and what's called presumed ocular histoplasmosis. So in the context of acute pulmonary histoplasmosis, you don't need to treat the patient if they're asymptomatic, if they have mild disease, if there are mild focal infiltrates on the chest imaging. And the reason for this is because this is a self-limiting infection without uh, sequelae. On the other hand, if the patient is moderately or severely ill with bilateral diffuse infiltrates on the X-ray or immunocompromised in any way, then treatment should be given. And amphotericin B is the standard initial therapy given for one to two weeks, usually followed by triconazole for 12 weeks. In patients who are not that ill and ambulant, then triconazole is also very active against histo and that is sufficient without having to initiate therapy with amphotericin. Always check for drug interactions, of course. Now, in patients with disseminated histoplasmosis, then it's important to give early and appropriate antifungal therapy. And if the underlying disease is poorly controlled, then to try and control that. So as an example of that, antiretroviral therapy in patients with HIV is started at the same time as treatment for a acute disseminated histoplasmosis. So typically treatment is given for at least 12 months and if you can measure antigen in the blood or urine then it's helpful to check that this disappears. Patients have been given gamma interferon therapy if they're known to be deficient in IL-12 or gamma interferon itself although the patient the group of patients with adult immunodeficiency syndrome with gamma interferon antibodies probably wouldn't respond to gamma interferon supplementation. And in that group of patients, then plasmapheresis or rituximab is usually used. That's a rare setting, but it's an important problem to recognize. So how treatment is given, typically liposomal amphotericin B at around three milligrams per kilogram is given for two weeks. And that then is followed by a triconazole orally. Again, drug interactions need to be checked. In milder cases, or those with very mild immunosuppression, then itraconazole alone is quite successful. So an example of that is patients with higher CD4 so counts and HIV infection with just lymphadenopathy. Liposomal amphotericin B has a better response rate than conventional amphotericin B and has a lower mortality. So that is the preferred drug if it's available to you and affordable. 
If itraconazole cannot be given, then voriconazole, posaconazole, or azabuconazole may be useful. Fluconazole is definitively less effective against uh, histoplasmosis than these other drugs. Be aware of adrenal insufficiency because histoplasma enters the adrenal glands quite often and you end up with patients with problem with adrenal insufficiency because of the uh, use of itraconazole in some of those patients. Also, some patients are thought to have tuberculosis and be treated with rifampicin, which can also cause a drug interaction issue. So in chronic disseminated histoplasmosis, the benefits of antifungal therapy include resolution of the gastrointestinal lesions. Patients who have adrenal dysfunction may get some recovery of the adrenal gland function, probably include improved survival in those with adrenal gland dysfunction and masses, which may be unilateral or bilateral, and it also avoids later complications, probably, because there's not much data, with, for example, gut stricture or subsequent dissemination if patients become immunosuppressed. Itraconazole dose is usually 200 milligrams a day in non-immunocompromised patients, increasing to 400 milligrams a day if they are in, if they have HIV infection or any problems with gut absorption, and it's typically given for 6 to 12 months. Amphotericin may be given, particularly in those who have been given rifampicin for any length of time or have other significant drug interactions. As I've indicated, it's important to proactively address the problem of adrenal insufficiency in these patients to avoid an Addisonian crisis. If it's possible to measure itraconazole levels, then this is also a valuable thing to do. In chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis, antifungal therapy arrests the progression of this disease and improves symptoms. You also get culture conversion from positive to negative, and it probably improves survival, although there isn't very much data on that. But we know that this is a disease that has a quite a significant mortality over two to four years. Itraconazole is given for a longer period of time, although there's very little supportive data for that, particularly typically 12 to 24 months. And again, ensuring itraconazole levels of therapeutic is important. It's also important to uh, follow the imaging on the chest x-ray or CT scan. And there's a relapse following treatment of around 15%, and this may be partly governed by whether drug levels are therapeutic and whether there's continuing other problems in the lungs uh, leading to a relapse. And many of these patients have COPD uh, and have been smokers, not all, but many, and so there is a possibility that you have a coexistent lung cancer, and this needs to be watched for. So this table um, shows the treatment for the common histoplasmosis syndromes. In fact, none of them are very common, other than the ones I've spoken to. And it summarises the situation. The ones I've not really discussed in any detail include mediastinal lymphadenitis. And if the glands are very bulky or there is compression of a, a mediastinal structure, then therapy would be indicated. Very occasionally, these glands can perforate, and that's a, a, an issue. The other thing I haven't discussed very much at all is bronchiolithiasis, which is a, like a stone in the airways related to histoplasmosis, which doesn't need treatment, and nor does a pulmonary nodule, which may be found on biopsy in, in, in patients. As I've indicated, those with progressive disseminated or mild to moderate disease should also be treated. So the response to therapy in disseminated disease is about 60 to 80 percent and there is a relapse rate particularly if the patients remain immunocompromised. Those who have a relapse should probably have lifelong therapy. There's a suspicion that there may be some subtle immunodeficiency which is not well identified in those patients. Disseminated histoplasmosis has a hundred percent mortality in immunocompromised patients it's got a high mortality as well in CNS disease, uh, which is about less than 5% of patients who have uh, histoplasmosis have CNS disease, but it has a high mortality. And overall, even with treatment, the mortality in HIV patients is 20 to 40%. Uh, the other forms of disease, such as colonic or adrenal disease, has a lower mortality, but it isn't a zero mortality, and that's important. 
the factors responsible for patient deteriorating on treatment are that the patient, the treatment is just not working and none of the treatments are 100% effective. In HIV and other uh, settings where there's a reversal of immunosuppression, you can get an iris syndrome or immune reconstitution syndrome. And you can also have apparent relapse or failure because there's another disease ongoing. If you patients seem to be deteriorating and you're suspecting an iris syndrome, then this may be an issue and they may require, for example, a short course of steroids. But you can probably make this diagnosis if they have good adherence to antifungals. The antifungal levels are in the normal range. There is a declining antigenemia or antigenuria and all the cultures affected. So that would be the circumstances in which you may consider a diagnosis of iris, which is otherwise relatively uncommon. So in conclusion, itraconazole is the first line of therapy for all the patients except those who are critically ill or highly immunocompromised. Liposomal amphotericin is the second line therapy or first line if the patients are very ill, and that is preferable to deoxycholate amphotericin B, and that definitively improves outcome and survival. Be alert and check for adrenal insufficiency, particularly if rifampicin has been given. The treatment of disseminated disease should be for at least 12 months, and preferably until antigenemia and antigenuria have disappeared. And if you cannot use itraconazole or there's a failure of therapy or some other drug interaction issue, then the other azoles may well be effective. Voriconazole, posaconazole or isabuconazole but preferably not fluconazole. This has a, has a 25 to 30% lower response rate than itraconazole. Many thanks.